Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you tonight for Bending the Heavens, Subjugation to the Will of God. And if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 18, verse 1. Exodus 18, verse 1. And when you have it, please say amen. Alrighty, Exodus 18, verse 1, and it reads, When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done to Moses, and for Israel his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. I'd like to welcome you all tonight for tonight's Torah teaching. Uh, it's entitled, Bending the Heavens. Tonight we're going to learn about connecting heaven to earth. Do you all remember at Mount Sinai when God delivered the Ten Commandments to the Israelite people? The, the rabbis teach us that the Israelites ascended to a level of sinful sinlessness and purity that had not been experienced since the time that Adam and Eve were in the garden. And for a short period of time, they experienced that degree of elevation. So tonight's teaching again is entitled, Bending the Heavens. Um, Parsha Yithro, which I believe was, was about, a, about two weeks ago, from Exodus chapter 18. And it says, when Jethro, who's Jethro? Moses' Exactly, Moses, Moses' father-in-law. He was the priest of Midian. But he had, re, he had renounced his position as the priest of Midian. He was the father-in-law of Moses, and he heard of all that God had done for Moses. Mm. You know what's strange is? God had split the Sea of Reeds, or as we call it, the, the Red Sea. The mm. entire world knew about the miracles that God wrought in Egypt. They knew about the plagues. They knew about the splitting of the sea. But only one man came to give glory to God, and that was Jethro. And one thing that happened is after the Israelites crossed the sea and, and then shortly after they were attacked by Amalek, as soon as Amalek attacked, actually before Amalek attacked, the fear of God fell upon the entire earth. All the nations feared the God of Israel. I mean, can you imagine it, after seeing all those plagues and, and how God set the Israelite people free from subjugation to the most powerful nation in the world? So when God subdued the powers of Egypt and the Israelites came across the Red Sea on dry ground, I mean, can you imagine how that impact, impacted the known world? The fear of God fell upon the world. But what took place shortly after is Amalek attacked. And Amalek, who we'll be, sell, who we'll be learning much about during this season of Purim, and next week we're going to actually switch from Exodus, from Shemot, and go into teachings on, on Esther and about finding your true identity in God. What took place, every time a Malik attacks, he cools off the people of God. And at the, and at the, at the time that he attacked, because a Malik w- was successful in his mission, because the, um, the mission of a Malik is to cool God's people off from serving God, mm-hmm. to, to cool people off from being on fire for God. Mm-hmm. You see how Jesus rebuked the church of Laodicea in Revelation, because that, that, that church was cooled off. And it's, it's more dangerous to be cooled off rather than to be hot or cold. To be in the middle is a very dangerous place. And you can see even the things that are happening here in America, even some of the laws that have been passed, it's, 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 just, it's heartbreaking to see that we can stoop to such a low level. Because we've been so cooled off, haven't we? To, 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 to where abortion can be performed yeah. all the way up till right before, before birth. I mean, mm-hmm. I never imagined that we, we would come to such a, a place of depravity. Mm-hmm. But, I know, but my prayer tonight is that through this teaching and through his holy Torah and through, through our intercession that God is going to bring reparation. Amen. amen. Yeah. Reparation. Yes. Amen. Yes. It's never too late for a turnaround. Yeah. Yeah. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. And even as you're reading this tonight, you're not just reading history. You are coming out of your personal Egypts as well. You are coming out of your places of subjugation. Is there a place in the workplace, a place in the family, a, a place where you feel so constricted, so restricted, Maybe you're not experiencing elevation and promotion in your career. Maybe it's in the ministry. Wherever it may be, you may, you may be in a place where you just feel stuck. 
Well, the anointing of this season is that you're going to come out of that place. Amen? Amen. I believe the, the Word of God, through the anointing of the Spirit of God, can bring you through any single situation, anything. Amen? Yes. Because your, guide, your, your guidebook to life is the Word of God. Amen. Amen? It is the Word of God. And the blueprint is laid out through the Jewish people throughout the Scriptures, from Genesis through Revelation. Mm -hmm. And so when Jethro heard, what did Jethro hear about? Jethro heard of the splitting of the Sea of Reeds. He heard about the war against Amalek. I mean, he, he had heard what had taken place, and he knew what had taken place, but the rest of the world was cooled off because of Amalek. Mm -hmm. Now, it also says, and this is quoting from Midrash Rabbah, speaking about Jethro, quoting Proverbs 27.10, better a close neighbor than a distant brother. Mm -hmm. Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. Better a close neighbor than a distant brother. Now, you can all relate that to your family, right? You can mm -hmm. all, in different situations, it, with, 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 with relatives and such. Um, but it, this also applies to the relationship that Jacob had with his twin brother Esau. And the relationship that he had with his father-in-law, Jethro. A close neighbor is, the, is, is Midian. Jethro of Midian was his close neighbor. And it says, better a close neighbor than a distant brother. You know who his distant brother was? Esau. Mm -hmm. And what's even more distant is that Amalek was the grandson of Esau. Mm -hmm. Also representing a, um, you know, the, the grandson of a distant brother. So the voice of God, when it says Jethro heard, from that we learn through the, rabbi, through the rabbis, the voice of God was audible throughout the entire universe. But it was only Jethro that heard, it was only Jethro that came. You know, it, it reminds me of the time when Jesus healed all the lepers, but only one man returned to give glory to God. And Jesus asked, where are the others? I healed, uh, I healed ten. How often do we return to God and give Him thanks for the things that He's done for us? Amen. Amen. As we're reading tonight, Amen. I want you to allow the Spirit of God to make this personal, make it applicable to your current situation right now. Because every, not, there is not a single letter, a single punctuation mark, not a single space in the text that is not applicable in your life right now. Amen. Amen. All the scripture is pertinent to your destiny. Amen. Then Psalm 19, not Psalm, Shemot or Exodus 13, 7, so 19, 17 says, Moses brought the people out toward God from the camp, and they stood at the bottom of the mountain. So when, when, when we read here that they stood at the bottom of the mountain, what comes to your mind? That they stood right at Mount Sinai, right? That they, they, they stood right there. Now I want you to take it literally. It says that they stood at the bottom of the mountain. There's rabbinic commentary that says that God lifted the mount up from the ground, turned it upside down over the Israelites, and it was like a wedding canopy over the Israelite over the Israelites. And that is where they became a holy nation, a nation of priests of, of kings and priests to God. Uh, there's one commentary that says this teaches that God overturned the mountain upon them like a inverted cask and said to them, if you accept the Torah, fine. If not, there shall be your burial. I don't want you to, I don't want you to take that literally, but, I, but as we teach this shir tonight, this teaching tonight, it's going to become more clear to you. Amen? Amen. God is not a cruel God where he's going to force you to, to serve him. God wants all, each and every one of us to serve him out of our free will. Amen? He's not going to kill us because we don't serve him. Because we, we choose the level of, of subjection that we want to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. He's not going to force himself upon us. God has never forced himself upon me in any area of life. It's I have to be willing to lay my life down and serve him to a greater degree. Amen? Amen. And when I struggle with it, I ask the Holy Spirit, give me the, I ask you to give me the grace. Please give me the grace to serve you in a more excellent way. You know, every time the ministry calls a fast, I'm not jumping up and down, oh, yay, we're going to fast. No, I ask the Lord, the Holy Spirit, please give me the grace yeah. to fast. Because there are things that don't come easy to me. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe fasting may come easy to you, and some, people, some, some of you have a natural disposition to enter into fasting. But for me, it's, it's, it's always a struggle. Yeah. For whenever it comes time for a fast, 
I, I, I have a bigger appetite. It happens every single time. <laughs> As soon as the fast is called, I don't stop thinking about food. I, go, <laughs> I don't know why I come to Torah to confess all my issues, but, I, but that, that's, that's what happens every single week. <laughs> Thank you for that. Now, um, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read the blog that I put out. I put it out in, while I was in India uh, about, a, about a week ago. And um, I didn't know what it was going to be for tonight's teaching, but I, I just posted it just, just to share it with you. And at the giving of the Ten Commandments, and if you want to read this, just go to www.destinedfortorah.com and just click on blog and you'll see this most recent entry. And what I wrote there is, at the giving of the Ten Commandments, a bending of the heavens took place and God descended upon Mount Sinai. So imagine God Almighty descending upon the earth. And... When he descended, as Exodus 19.20 tells us, the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai to the peak of the mountain, and the Lord summoned Moses to the peak of the mountain, and Moses ascended. Moses was a man of such humility, and he was the meekest man that walked upon the face of the earth. He did not ascend until God called him. And that should be a secret for you to ascend in your prayer life, is wait for God. Just sit before him and wait for him to call you. Amen? Mm -hmm. Moses never entered the tabernacle unless the the Lord summoned him. Mm -hmm. And then God God spoke in Exodus 20, verse 1. God spoke all these words. (coughs) Well, guess what? When God first spoke, he spoke all ten commandments. In a single utterance. Mm-hmm. See, God's not limited the way we are by by the way we speak. God spoke all Ten Commandments in a single utterance. And after he spoke the te- after he spoke the commandments in a single utterance, then he began to expound and explain each of the Ten Commandments. Now I'm not going to talk about this tonight, but I did I believe I did about a year or two ago mm-hmm. in the Ten Commandments. Commandment number one correlates to commandment number six. Number two to seven, three to eight, four to nine, and five to ten. That's how the commandments are related. One to five, two to you know, two to six, and, and, and so on. But uh, again, I won't expand on that tonight. And God spoke how many commandments? Ten. 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 When God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis one, how many utterances do we have? Ten. 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 Every time God said, and God said, every time we read, and God said. That's an utterance. And if you just do it, just go ahead and do a count, circle every time, and God said, you'll read it, you'll get that ten times. So there is a connection between Genesis 1 and, 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 and the giving of the Ten Commandments. So there, there, there is such a unifying with God that should take place in your lives during, during this time. We, we, God does not give His commandments just to make us miserable. You know how many? Of you, I mean, how many of you have kids that keep asking why when you give them rules? Why? Why? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? Why? 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 And and, and often it's, it's for it's for your own good, and that's how God deals with us. And so, in uh, going back to Exodus 19 verse 17, they stood under the mountain, and and the and the rabbis teach us that God lifted the mountain off the ground turn it upside down over Israel and it was like a wedding canopy over them. Isn't that awesome? I also want you to see the, 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 the ten com- after every commandment that God spoke, the Israelites said for the positive commands, they said we will do and for the negative commandments, they said we, we will not. It's very similar to a marriage ceremony where after the, the minister states every vow, your response is I do. See, these are marriage vows that took place. Mm-hmm. Now, fast forwarding, after Moses ascended up into the mountain, after the giving of the Ten Commandments, and Moses did not come down in the time expected, in the 40-day, end of the 40-day period, and the Israelites built a golden calf and danced around it and worshipped it. And then as Moses is coming down from the camp, he heard what was going on. He could actually see what was going on as well. And what did Moses do? He took the two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, and threw them to the ground and broke them, and they shattered them to pieces. Mm-hmm. Moses did not do that in a burning rage. Mm-hmm. 
Moses did that out of compassion for the Jewish people. Because what Moses thought, in, in Moses' reasoning, these two, ta- these two tablets of stone are, are a marriage covenant between God and his people. And if the people are in the camp committing a- idolatry or a form of a- adultery against God in the camp, guess what? This marriage contract, which seals our, the marriage, he thought by breaking it, he would, he would break that covenant. He would break that marriage connection. Oh, he did wow. that in intercession for love for the Israelite people. And that is an example of a true leader. I believe it was several weeks ago, some weeks ago before I left for India, we taught about, about leadership. And a, a true leader is one that's not out for their own agenda, but their primary concern is, is for the welfare of others. I can think of no greater leader than to have Moses in my camp. Amen? Amen. And then when, when God bent down, he bent down, he bent the heavens and spread his garments upon Mount Sinai. I mean, this is not literal, that this is figurative, but whenever you read about garments, even as the, as the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of Christ's garment, you, you know, we always think about what, what is in that cloth, but I want you to go a little bit deeper than, than, than the material. Because whenever you read about garments, the Hebrew word for character traits is the word midot. It can mean character, it can mean um, measurements, it can have several different meanings. But whenever you read about garments, often garments represent character traits. Mm -hmm. So what the woman with the issue of blood did is that she connected with the character of Christ. Mm -hmm. She connected with his compassion. She connected with his loving kindness. And, and And her faith was was put to action and and, and she received her healing. Amen? Amen. I encourage every one of you to connect with the attributes of Christ Jesus, to connect with his loving kindness, to connect with him. You know, so many of us have such a negative view of God. You know, we go through circumstances in life, things things go wrong, we might have a loved one die, maybe even a loved one commit suicide, and sometimes we go through devastating things in life, and you go, why God, why God? You know what? Don't even bother asking the question. There, there are some things that are just just like a child a- asking you an adult-like question. Sometimes we're asking questions that are beyond our understanding, and only God knows the an- God only God knows the answers. Amen. But allow God to use every single situation in your life to to bring you closer to Him. We are not just put on this earth ju- ju- just ju- ju- just to make a good living, to make good finances, and 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 to build a family. There's so much more. There's so much to life. Amen. And and, and, God, and God put you here on this earth for a purpose. You could have been, you could have been born in any time in history, but God chose you to live during this time. Amen. So I encourage you: don't waste the time that you have have here. Allow God to develop you into the person that He's designed you to be. Amen. Amen. I know we overuse the word destiny all the time, and I even call this service a destiny for Torah. But I mean, often we think about de- when I speak about destiny, I speak about I'm speaking about w- finding out who you are in God, mm-hmm. and to find out how you fit into God's tapestry of creation. Amen. And it's not always glamorous. Some people are, are called to go through tremendous testings. You know, um, who who was the, the the minister that Dr. Corell had come to the ministry years ago? Rembrandt. William Rembrandt. William Rembrandt mm-hmm. to see how he was persecuted mm-hmm. for his faith in Christ, mm-hmm. and and through I mean he, he, when he came to the ministry he was he actually came barefoot because he was so so much pain but he would den- mm-hmm. he neither he nor his wife would deny their their faith in Christ Jesus Amen, wow. Amen. Mm-hmm. and I'm telling I mean and and some of us are called to the most excruciating and painful lives and only God knows why. You know, why were six million Jews killed in the Holocaust? I can't answer that question. But I know I, I know God was working in that. Amen? Amen? I know God is working. But of course, I, can, I, I cannot, you know, I, I can't answer, there's questions I can't answer. But sometimes we just need to have faith in God. Yeah. That we just fully trust in Him. And Lord, you have, you have your way. <laughs> mm-hmm. Have your way. Amen? In the Genesis 1-1, in the beginning of God's creation of the heaven and the earth. 
during this life, I mean, God is developing you spiritually, representing the heavens, and God is is also building you in, in the way you relate to the world. That represents the earth. Amen. Because uh, as human beings, male and female, we we have we are both spiritual and physical beings. Unlike angels, which are purely spiritual beings, and and um, animals, which are a, a different type of have a, an, an, an animal type soul, but but we are made in the image and likeness of God. We we have intellect. We have the ability to ascend to infinite spiritual heights, and we have the also unfortunately we also have the ability to descend to the lowest <coughs> lows of depravity. Mm. But my prayer is that we're all going to ascend mm. through His Holy Word. Amen. Amen. Now let's turn to Exodus 19:12. I'm going to ask Dr. Vicky if he'll come up and read this for us. You can just read it from my from my laptop here. I'm going to read this to you. We're going to read this to you from the. Um, the Chabad.org edition, Shemot, or Exodus 19, verse 12. I believe it's the same verse in your Bibles as well. Shemot 19, 12. And you shall set boundaries for the people around, saying, Beware of ascending the mountain or touching its edge. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Thank you. You may all wonder, what's the point of even reading this? And if you're not asking that question, I don't, I don't think you're being honest. But you, you, sometimes you read text in the Bible and you wonder, what is this all about? You know, it'd be like going to Brother Ed's house and Sister Cheryl's house, and they put a boundary, they put, they put a, a boundary around their house and saying, if you cross this boundary, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be put to death. Mm. And that's how we read it. We, 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 we read it in the literal sense. And of course, at that time, it was in a literal sense because God's holy presence was there. And God instructed Moshe Rabbeinu to create a restricted area around the mountain into which none of the people were, were, were allowed to enter. The boundary was a representation or an indication of the covenant the Jewish people were making with God. I want to talk, so I want you to think about boundaries for a second. For example, for those of you that, that have made marriage vows, and you said, I do, and the minister pronounced you um, man and wife. During those vows, boundaries were created in, in that relationship, that you will not commit adultery, you will not come, enter into any kind of fornication, but your commitment is to one another until death do you part. Right. Mm -hmm. So though, so what in the marriage, in, in the vows that you make, there, there there were boundaries being created, boundaries that did not exist before you entered into the marriage covenant. Mm -hmm. And when you enter into the marriage covenant with God, even through the Ten Commandments, you have entered into a relationship to be to to remain faithful to the Lord God. Mm -hmm. Amen. That means you're not going to have any of the gods before you. That you that you're fully that you you can be fully committed to to the to, to, to the God of Israel, and it requires that we we, we avoid stealing, we we avoid murder. It means that we we avoid speaking lashon hora, which is evil speech, and we and and, and not and, and not to hate. Amen. Amen. I don't see, you don't look too excited tonight. <laughs> Wonderful. It's, it's powerful, isn't it? Yes. So cuz cuz we've entered into a marriage. Liter this is a marriage that's yes. for eternity. We're in awe. Yeah, aren't we're we? In we're awe in awe of the word we're hearing. Amen. Thank you Lord God. And then I mean and and then your the other mitzvot or other commandments require specific actions. That means in our speech, in our emotions, you know, we always say, what is, what is adultery? Well, adultery is having, a, um, you know, physical relations with someone that's not your spouse. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? It, that's, not, that's not how Jesus defined it. Even to think a, a lustful thought against a, a person that's not your spouse is adultery. Mm -hmm. See, G, Jesus goes beyond the letter of the law and goes into the spirit of the law. And we, we need, you know, sometimes we, want, we, we, all, we always te teach or we think that the, that the God of the Hebrew Scriptures is very is very strict, but the God of the New Testament is very lenient, mm -hmm. and and the, it's not true at all. God is the same yesterday, mm -hmm. today, yeah. and forever. Amen. Yes. 
Yeah. You know, uh, Christians call the uh, the Hebrew scriptures the Old Testament. I, I prefer to call it the, the Tanakh or the Hebrew scriptures for Genesis through through uh, Malachi. But God does not change. Whenever I read all about the, the the wanderings of Israel in the wilderness, when I read about all the the kings that fell away from God, all I see is God's mercy and how long suffering God is. So God has not changed. And even we in America, even when we in our lives sin, God doesn't judge us right away. God is so merciful. He's so patient with us. Amen. So he, he does not change. But when it comes to sin, he, Jesus was not lenient in terms of sin. Of course, he always led with the, with the um, garment or with the character trait of, 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 of long-suffering and forgiveness. But when, when the woman that was caught in adultery, he told, her, he, he told her, your sins are forgiven you. Go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was very strict in terms of sin. Amen? But yet he knows that we're flesh, and he does forgive us. Amen? Yes. But that does not give, give us the license to sin. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard some say, I'm going to live life, I'm going to sin life, I'm going to sin to the fullest, and repent right before I die. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? You don't know when you're going to die. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, 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 don't gamble your life away like that. That's right. Amen? That's right. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Because, you know, the fear of God yeah. needs to return back to the earth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Whether you're Christian or not a Christian, whatever mm -hmm. faith you may be in, the fear of God is lacking in the yeah. earth. Yeah. That, you know, we, 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 we don't, we, we, there's no concept of, of reaping what you sow. Mm -hmm. There's no concept of the fear of God that God sees everything. God sees every single detail. Everything. He knows every thought. He knows every action. He knows everything ab about us. Our attitudes. Everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the restrictions represent that, that we agree to be constrained. We agree to be limited. We agree to live by boundaries. That means I love God, that we love God so much, that Lord, I love you so much that I don't want to live a life of prayerlessness. Mm -hmm. Lord, I love you so much that I don't want to live a life of gossiping about Mama Lupe. Lord, I love you so much that I don't want to I don't want to entertain sin in my life. Does that mean I'm going to be perfect? No, but but you know what? It, it sh sin should not be habitual in my life. And when I do fall and I and I do mess up from time to time, guess what? I I want to recover quickly. Yeah. Um, I read this. When we live by the Torah. We are greater than the angels because we are changing. We are becoming greater. Mm -hmm. See, angels don't have the ability. They are not made with the ability to ascend to higher spiritual heights. Yeah. But mankind, male and female, God has given us the grace, the gift to be able to ascend. So I believe for all eternity, we'll, we will continue to study yeah. the Word of God. Continue. It's going to be eternal. Mm -hmm. It might take me 10 million years just to get past Genesis 1-1 because it's really my favorite my favorite scripture in the entire Bible. So during this during during this season, allow God to and to cause you to rise to your highest calling. Just as when you mix water and oil, what rises to the to, to the top? The oil. Let the oil, let the anointing arise in you and allow God to raise you up to the heights that he wants, wants to bring you to. Yeah. And I'm telling you, life is not easy. Mm -hmm. If I come out here and tell you, if, if you, if you serve Christ, everything's going to be wonderful and easy, mm -hmm. that's not true. The opposite is true. But I'm telling you, it's the most wonderful life and it's the most fulfilling life. Amen. So, I mean, whenever, ever since I said yes to Christ and received Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. when I received him as my Messiah, I'm telling you, it has been, I mean, just the most glorious yeah. experiences ever. Yeah. Most yeah. glorious Amen. experiences. Yeah. And it's a life filled with miracles. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a life filled with so much joy. Mm -hmm. And to see how God has walked, you know, I, I could ask every one of you the same question. How has God moved in your life? And every one of you has a testimony. Every one of you. I mean, I can give you the testimony of how I met my met my wife Bhavna for like the thousandth time. <laughs> I think I've done it at least a thousand times. <laughs> Next time we'll have Brother Ed tell about uh, tell his testimony. Uh, now let's go to the next parsha. We, we we that was a quick summary of Parsha Jethro or Yithro. Now let's go to Parsha Mishpatim. Can you say Mishpatim? Mishpatim. This that was last week's parsha from Exodus 21 verse 1 through 24 verse 18. 
And from Shemot chapter 21, verse 1, or Exodus 21, verse 1, I'm going to ask Dr. Vicky if you'll come up one more time. She's getting a workout tonight from all the way from the back of the room, all the way to the front. Mishpatim. Parsha Mishpatim, the Torah portion of Mishpatim, or, or laws, and right there. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. Amen. These are very lengthy readings. These are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. See, when you read when you read this, you know, you often get like, what is this all about? And you quick you quickly read through it. But it's like the what, what do we say? The devils in the details. It's, it, it, I mean, it, there's just in the, the the few words that I use here. There is so much that Moses is telling us. These are the judgments which you shall set before them. The judgments are lost. And there's three explanations for these judgments. The first is, because it says, it, see the wording here? The wording here from Chabad.org. Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. Before whom? Before you. Before, and, and before the Jewish people. So before them has three explanations. The first one is, and I'll just read this to you. The first is that every legal dispute among the Jews should be tried before them, before a Jewish court of law, which tries cases according to the Torah. Yeah. So, if, if so, if, so if you if you were a Jew, an Israelite living, uh, you know, at, you know, l- l- living at the time of Moses, or even after the time of Moses, and you have a dispute, you know, let's say um, R- Rabbi Nelson stole my bicycle. <laughs> and you know I could I could take him to I could take him to you know um, a, a local court a secular court or I can take him to the um, to a to a Jewish court of, court of law mm-hmm. and if I if I choose the secular or the Gentile court of law guess what I'm in violation of the Torah mm-hmm. so I, so since since so so let's mm-hmm. say. Rabbi Nelson is a Jew and I'm a Jew. I we must take our case to to, to, to the Jewish court. Now Paul uses the Apostle Paul uses the same concept in First Corinthians chapter six. And he's speaking to the Christians. He says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that you shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Amen? So everything that you read in the Torah, you, you, you will find a parallel in the New Testament scriptures. And so Paul was rebuking the church of Corinth for, take, for taking... Uh, legal to taking disputes that were occurred between the brethren and taking it to a Gentile court rather than allowing the church to judge it. Mm-hmm. And here um, Moses is teaching the people. God is teaching the people through Moses that if you have a dispute, bring it to the bring it to the Jewish court of law. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the first interpretation. The second the second explanation of before them is when one is teaching the Torah to a pupil or a student. He should show the face. Can you say show the face? Show the face. That means you should explain the reason for the law so that your student understands rather than just receiving it as dogma. So you should do your very best to explain that law to that person. So, you know, often when I'm around kids, whether it's my nieces or or nephew, Often the question they keep asking is why, and with any instruction or any commandment from mom and dad, why, 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 why? And often parents get so tired and say, just because I, because I said so. But sometimes you need to take the time and explain why, you know, explain why it's wrong to steal, explain why it's wrong to eat candy 24 hours a day. You know, something. You know, we, 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 these things need to be explained. My nephew likes candy this much. Actually, a lot more than that. But you know, and, and but you know, we need to, we need to be 
taught why certain things are bad for us. Amen. And that includes if, if it's that if, if it's applicable applicable in the world, how much more so in terms of spirituality. The other thing I want to bring out here is, let's see, about the, the commandments. Is that even with situations in your own life, things that you struggle with, even sin, things, it could be sin, it doesn't have to be sin, but every area of your life is allow God to settle even the things in your own heart that don't sit right with you. You know, there, sometimes there's things that happen that I just don't understand. And you know what? I have to allow the Holy Spirit to settle those disputes inside of me. Because my greatest disputes are not with you. They're often with ish- things that I'm struggling with it- internally. And so, uh, and God addresses that as well. Our emotions, even our, uh, even our own shortcomings in our character. Allow, allow God to settle even internal disputes. And then the third thing, w- w- the third concept here about before them is... And this is from the Alta Rebbe. He says, "Before them means to their innermost selves." Can you say that with me? Innermost yes. selves. <clears throat> that means the knowledge of God should reach the most inward part of your soul. Mm-hmm. See, that's the, the word. It just it soaks in. It's it's going to affect you physically. Mm-hmm. It's going to get into your mind. It's going to get to your emotions, and it's going to go into the very the deepest crevices of your soul. And, it, and it's going to bring healing. You know, for, the, for, for those of you that may have experienced any form of sexual uh, uh, abuse or, or, or rape or any type of, you know, any type of horrific situation like that. And, and, and many folks never re- recover from, from that type of devastation. But the, wor- the, the Holy Word of God can bring healing through any situation. Mm-hmm. Through any, through anything. Mm-hmm. And just allow that Word to go into you and, and bring restoration. There may be some of you that have re- experienced tremendous rejection in your life. Rejected by mom and dad. Uh, you, you know, always condescended. O- always speaking ill about. Always talking, even parents talking to the siblings uh, uh, bad things about you. And, and those are things that are very hard to get healed from. You know, it's very hard to get healed from a spirit of rejection. But the word of God can bring healing in those areas as well. Amen. Amen. Every one of us has different dispositions. There's not one person in this room except for Rabbits and Terry that has a perfect life. But the rest of us have things that we need to overcome. And I'm joking. But the the treasure house of the Torah should awaken the treasure house of the soul. Amen? Amen? So allow the Word of God to illuminate every single aspect of your life and every relationship. Now we're going to talk about my favorite topic tonight. We're going to talk about slavery. Mm. We're going to talk about the, the Jewish bondman. Can you say that with me? The Jewish bondman. The non-Jewish bondman. And the Jewish bondwoman. Now let me, give, let me give it to you in the correct order. Number one, the Jewish bondman. Number two, the Jewish bondwoman. And number three, the non-Jewish bondman. Now before I explain this to you, I want to give you the concept in the New Testament, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. It doesn't say a dead sacrifice. It says a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then verse 2 reads, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen? Now that correlates to Exodus chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. Uh, Dr. Vicky. Exodus chapter 21. Verses 1 and 2. When you have it, please say amen. 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 All right, let's read this together. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant six years, he shall serve. And in the seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. Amen. Now, 
everything in the Word of God is applicable in every single generation. Even even though slavery does not legally exist in America, the scriptures are still applicable to every American today. Amen? So the, the laws of slavery allegorically reflect varying degrees of servitude to God. Three degrees of servitude. The laws of slavery allegorically represent the three levels of servitude that we have to God. Now remember earlier I told you that God does not force us to serve Him. God has, has, has God, God's desire is that we freely, out of our free will, we choose to serve Him. When God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, He placed two. He placed that He He gave them the, the the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God told them, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God did not build a fence around that tree. God waited. God allowed them to choose if they were going to partake of that tree. Because God wants us to serve Him out of our own free will. Amen? Amen. So, and so every person can attain a level of servitude that he or she desires. For example... Some people choose the, uh, 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 the religious life, mm-hmm. and they choose a life of not marrying. They they choose a life of just being before God. Mm-hmm. Some choose a life of of of, of, of a monk. Uh, that choose a life of solitude. But every one of us is called to different degrees of service. Amen. Amen. There are those that choose not to marry, but but their marriage is with with God alone. Amen. Amen. So, so we, we are all expected to serve God with total devotion, but God allows us to choose how much you want to serve Him. And God will give you the grace to serve Him at greater levels. Amen? Amen. So there are three levels of devotion to God corresponding to the three types of bond people. The first one is the Jewish bondman. Can you say the Jewish bondman? The Jewish bondman. Not speaking about bond 007, but the Jewish bondman. And... The Jewish bondman, um, I think, relates to Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. So what what Paul is describing in the epistles, in the epistle of, uh, uh, um, to the Galatians, what Paul is describing here is the Jewish bondman. And, and it's it relates someone that loves to serve God and that serves him, but they serve him expecting a good reward. There's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And all of us should expect a good reward. But it's the low, it's a lower level of serving God. Because what, what you're doing is, whether you're doing it on purpose or not, you're, you're saying, well, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do this because I know you're going to bless me. You know, or you may give your tithes and offerings because I know God, you're going to bless me if I bring my finances into the storehouse. Or Lord, I know you're going to bless me because I help the homeless. That's true. God is going to bless you, but if your motivation to serve God is based upon getting a reward, well, guess what? Then you're serving God at the level of the Jewish bondman. I don't think most of us ever heard this type of teaching, but 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 this this applies. See, you can take every part of the Torah. And you can apply it to your life today. When, when, when the Jews read this, they're under the 613 commandments. So, so they're reading it a certain way. But we, are, we as Christians are under the seven Noahid laws. And, and, but, but, and yet we can still apply the Torah in our lives today as well. Amen? So this, that first level, if I can find an example here. Because we're we're serving God, expecting a reward. So we comply to His will, because we're going to draw God's blessings into our life. And of course, I encourage all of you to do that, but don't stay there. I I want all of you to become Jewish bond women. And this is the highest level of service. And I want to read this to you. It says. She plays a central ro- central and vital role in the master's household. She prepares the food and is thus responsible for the health, enjoyment, and social welfare of the family. But think, think about a mother 
that, that takes care of everything in, in the household, that prepares the meals for, for, for the kids, that does everything out, out of selflessness and expects nothing in return. See, that's a higher level of service. You, you, you don't serve because you expect your kids to give you a pat on the back. You do it just because, because it needs to be done. That is a higher level of service. And in our Torah study, it represents we study the word of God for its own sake. Because at this level of becoming a Jewish bondwoman, and I'm speaking to male and female, at this level, you're, you're so united with God that you're not doing something to get something back in return. You're just doing it for the sake of doing it. Because, because there's, there's such a, a unifying a unity between you and the Lord. And th that is a very high degree of service. And I believe there are many people in this ministry that serve God at that level. Because, I mean, people, in, your friends probably don't understand why you serve God so much. But you know what? You do it because the love of God compels you. And you don't do it because you're expecting reward, even though you know you'll be rewarded. You do it just because you love Him and you want to be with Him. Amen? Yes. Now, the third level is the non-Jewish bondman, the final level. The, probably the level that none of us want to, want to be at. The non-Jewish bond, and actually I think all of us have degrees in, uh, of all three. The John, the non-Jewish bond. This person reminds me of Cain. He repented out of fear of punishment. So this is what it reads. He works due to fear of punishment. Not because he expects any emotional satisfaction. And, and that's really where a person where their flesh is still uh, very much in control. Let me give you an example. Something that nobody in this room ever does. The G word. The gossip word. You know, when you hear, when you hear you know, some, some really juicy piece of information about Brother Ed, you cannot wait to tell the other side of the room. And sometimes it's so hard not, not, to, say it, not to say a word. Well, guess what? At that level, I'm operating at the level of a non-Jewish bondman. Because my flesh is in control. I cannot wait to share that information. And the only thing that will keep me from saying it is, a, is fear of punishment. And we all have those areas in our life, don't we? You know, the, you know let's not be too religious tonight. We have areas that were, that were, the, were the Jewish bondmen, where we serve expecting a reward. Then there's areas in our life that are completely sold up, sold up to God, and that's the that's the level of a Jewish bondwoman where you, you you serve Him because you're united with Him and you have no expectations of reward. And the third the third degree the the, the lowest degree is the level where I don't want to serve Him, I don't want to serve Him, but I only do it because I'm afraid of because I'm afraid of punishment. It's like those that come to salvation in Christ because they don't want to go to hell. No other reason they just want to they want to avoid damnation. Uh, let me give you the ultimate example of service in the in the in the the Gospel of John, after after the resurrection, and so John twenty one fifteen through nineteen, I've used this reference many times. And when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonas, love lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, you know that I love you. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. I believe that was a level of subjugation. Then Jesus again asked him, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And he says to him, Yea, Lord, you know that I love you. Then Jesus commands him, Feed my sheep. Then Jesus asked him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And at this Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Do you love me? And he, he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. And you know what? God knows all things. Yes. And that was the correct answer. And Jesus says to him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto you, When you were young, you girded yourself, and you walked wherever you wanted. I'm, par I'm rephrasing it. When, when you shall be old, you shall stretch forth your hands, and another shall gird you, and carry you where you do not want to go. And Jesus prophesied to John the type of death in which he was going to glorify God. And Peter was hung, according to church history, Peter was hung upon a cross upside down. 
He refused to be crucified like Christ because he said, I'm not worthy to suffer like my Lord. And he was crucified upside down on his cross. And that is what God required of John. See, I can't answer why different people are called to different degrees of, of sacrifice. And of course, Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice by offering, by becoming the sacrificial lamb upon that cross. But in life, every one of us is called to carry our cross, and we all serve God in different degrees. The next Parsha, I've never covered this much before, Parsha Teruma, Exodus 25 through 27, verse 19. So you didn't really miss anything by, being, by me being away. It's, we're actually we're catching up tonight. Parsha Teruma, or Torah portion of Teruma, Teruma means contribution. Can you say contribution? Contribution. And well, I'm going to read Shemot 25, verse 2. We're almost finished. Speak to the children of Israel and have them take for me an offering for from every person whose heart inspires him to generously... No, that from every person whose heart inspires him to generosity. Can you say that with me? Inspires him to generosity. You shall take my offering. So what God is command what God is commanding Moses is take the offering to those that that are inspired to generosity. And even tonight, when we take an offering for the persecuted church in Egypt and for the and, 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 and for the children in in the um, refugee camps in Jordan. That's what our offerings are going for tonight. Amen. Is that I, I want your hearts to be stirred toward gener generosity. Amen? Amen. And that's and so that's how we take the offering, is that your heart is stirred to Amen. generosity. And I want you to give tonight at the level of the Jewish bondwoman. That you are serving God because you're so united with the purpose of God and the mission of God in the earth. Amen. Amen. So um if the New Testament reference that I use for this one is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. And the offering speaks about separation. It's spoken to those whose hearts are inspired to generosity. And whenever you bring an offering, you're bringing a part of yourself to the altar. Yeah. Amen? Yes. How many of you agree that, that given of your finances... It's probably one of the most difficult difficult things to do. It's, it's true for many of us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. For others, you have a natural um, disposition towards giving. But for, for, for most people, I believe it's very difficult to, 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 to walk in that level of generosity. And there are three kinds of teruma, three kinds of offering. The first type of offering is called the shekelim. Can you say that with me? The shekelim. Shekelim. The shekelim is an annual contribution of a half a shekel of silver that was paid by every single Jew, um, and, and, and that, sil that, that silver was used for the sockets of the, um, in, in, in the tabernacle. And it, it, and it was a one, to, it, it was, it, everyone, whether you're rich or poor, everyone gave the exact same contribution. So, um, so we're not going to give half shekels tonight. Mm -hmm. But, but but what we are going to give is that every one of us is giving of ourselves. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter if how rich or how poor you are. You, you, you're, you're giving of yourself. Mm. And tonight, as you're even as you're studying the Word of God with me, every one of you is offering that is bringing that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And then in verse three, Shemot twenty-five three, Exodus twenty-five three, this is the offering that you shall take from them: gold, silver, and copper. Can you look at your neighbor and say, gold, silver, and copper? And again, I want you to make this, we're going to make this applicable in our lives today. You know, I may ask Mother Aida to empty her purse and take out all the silver, all the gold, and all the copper out of her purse. The silver is given equally by all. The gold and, sil the gold and copper are given voluntarily as your heart inspires you to give. Mm. What has more value, gold or silver? Silver. Gold. Gold. Oh, I'll take all your gold. Uh, so, 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 gold so gold surpasses silver in value. Um, out of the three, which has the least value? Gold, silver, silver, or copper? Silver. 
Copper. Copper, right? Which is the most plenteous in the earth? Yeah. Copper. Copper. Exactly. So copper is so common that it lacks distinction. The gold, the silver, and copper represents three types of believers in God. The gold alludes to, to one's desire to arise into spiritual heights. I believe King David represents the gold. Because you, when your desire is to be entrenched in holiness, to be connected with God, to be in prayer, to live a life of being separate and just consumed in God's presence, that part of your life represents the gold. That's one type of believer. And in Revelation, Jesus says, Revelation 3.18, Jesus says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. So our desire should be to be consumed in God and to walk in His presence. Amen? Amen. Then the next level, which is a lower level, and, you, and again, you need both. You need both. I don't encourage you to live a life only of gold. You need the silver as well. Mm-hmm. Silver alludes to, is the reverse of what gold does. Gold represents your desire to ascend to higher spiritual heights. Mm-hmm. Silver does the very opposite. It, the, the purpose of silver is to draw holiness into the earth. Mm-hmm. That means in whatever you do in, in the parts of your life that are common, that are mundane, that you want to draw God's presence in, into your day-to-day activities. That means when you begin your work day with prayer, guess what you've done? You have infused your, your life with silver. Because I don't want I don't want to live my life only with the gold. I want even when I go in the workplace, I want my workplace to be infused with God's presence as well. Amen. So I infuse the presence of the Lord into my, my the atmosphere of my job. Now, what does it say about the days of King Solomon? In First Kings ten twenty seven, it says the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made he to be as sycamore trees. See, it says the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones. So I, whenever I read that scripture, I thought, wow, all the streets in Jerusalem all over were covered with silver. That's not what is being said here. What is being said here is that Solomon, with his wisdom, drew holiness in into even the most mundane aspects of life in Israel. And that's what we want to do. We want our houses covered with silver. Mm-hmm. Just like Robinson, Marilyn's house, it's covered with silver because she's drawn holiness in, into all the aspects of, 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 of her life. Mm-hmm. The copper represents those of us who live within the mundane but bring no light into it. So we don't want much copper in our life. But we all have areas of copper, don't we? We all have areas where, Lord, I don't want you in this area because I enjoy my sin too much. You know, we all have areas that we don't we don't welcome God into. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to reveal those areas to us where we have not invited you in. It could be in relationship. It could be even the way that you treat somebody. Maybe even the way that you treat someone that's part of your household. It's like, whereas there's no boundaries, where, where, where you're rude, you're, you're mean, you, 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 you may yell at that person all the time, but there, there may be certain relationships where you don't treat that person correctly. Well, guess what? That represents the copper. And we, we need to be able to replace that copper with another metal. Because we need to infuse our relationship with holiness. Amen? And we need to treat each other with dignity and with respect and, and without control. The, uh, the Hebrew word for copper is, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, nekoshet. It comes from the word for snake in Hebrew, which is nakash. Copper is a snake metal, a substance that recalls the stubborn impudence of the primordial snake's denial of God. It's horrifying, isn't it? And you know what? God required that all three metals be used in the construction of of Moses' tabernacle. See, we need to bring... The temple is what brings holiness 
to the elements that are inside. And within the temple is God's presence. So we need to bring all of because every one of us, as Paul tells us, every one of us is a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. And within our tabernacles are silver, gold, and copper. And allow God, you know, uh, uh, allow, allow God to work in the areas of your life where you're so stubborn, where you're so hard. You know, I think every one of us has a trigger word. Someone that's really hurt in your life. Someone that is really, you, you, you know, if, 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 if you're a parent and you know that so-and-so um, abused your children, that is a very difficult offense to forgive. Very difficult. It can take you, it can take a long time to 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 to, to forgive. But you know what? Th- that can become an area of copper in your life. So so you need to allow even those areas in your life to be infused with holiness, because it's not easy. It's not easy to forgive those those type of atrocities. Or maybe you're a parent where your child was abducted. Uh, abducted. I mean, all the emotional stuff that's involved with that and. You know, it's almost worse. You know, you're like, is my child is my child okay? Is my child being treated okay? When will I see my child again? You know, all all these emotions that are stirring up in you. But I'm telling. But you know what? That God gives us the Torah, the Word of God, as a blueprint to help us through every single emotional difficulty. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm going through difficulty, especially emotional difficulties, I can't wait to get out of it. Mm-hmm. Instead of going, Lord, teach me through this and teach me through the process. I just go, Lord, just pull me out of the fire. Mm-hmm. But that's not how God deals with us all the time. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he pulls us out of the fire, but other times we have to go through the process. Mm-hmm. You know, just as gold is refined in the fire, well, guess what? You're going to be refined in this fire as well. Mm-hmm. I'm going to invite you just to stand with me. Let's just worship the Lord. I'm going to ask Sister Rebecca Kish to come up and lead us with another song. And Lord, we just thank you tonight for tonight's teaching. I thank you, Lord God, for your goodness tonight, Lord God. I just thank you, Lord God, for your mercy. I just bless your people tonight, Father God, that have joined us tonight. In Jesus' holy name we pray.